it's certainly working for is it working for everybody else just give me a nod or shout or i'm very happy to have i'm very happy to have cameras on um uh, sound on even even if there are dogs but i mean i don't know what it is about people you know apologizing for children and dogs barking and stuff like that uh, i think it reminds us all that we're uh we're, we're, we're human and this is I mean this is part of the big challenge isn't it that we uh, we seem to want to separate out our kind of work selves and our rest of life selves and of course there isn't a magic doorway that we all go through and we come we all of a sudden become these really serious work people who are going to follow every policy and rule under the sun uh, which I suppose is uh, what has got me here today and why I'm talking about what I call the Anthropotechnican um, because the general trend isn't it is to uh, say that uh, oh you know users are your weakest link and then we realize that's not very PC and it's not very encouraging so we start saying that it's their strongest asset uh, but as soon as anything goes wrong we're just full of all the whole blame game again and so it's all pretty miserable and people don't really do what they should be doing well in my opinion and of course a lot of this is opinion some of it is properly researched and some of which uh, i'm going to tell you is really what i'm looking to do going forward because as i was putting this together uh, i suddenly realized that it's actually uh, just about 10 years in a few months time uh, since i got my phd uh which you know took a long time but then again you would have probably expect that but it just goes to show that just because you get a 2-2 poly degree uh doesn't need to mean that you stop so i'm going to take you on a bit of a journey uh i myself i'm still learning which is why i i do this job it's why i went into my first job uh, i went to manchester poly and I remember sitting up late one night writing my dissertation project and I thought this would be great if you could do this sort of research and writing and learning as a living. Uh, so I joined a firm to be a technical writer uh, and I was working on all kinds of fun stuff on road, tra tra uh, blah, road transport because when they asked us at the interview, what do you want to work on? Of course, then I was a student and uh, the choice was civil or military. And of course, students oh, don't want to work on military systems. And of course, after about two years on the civil systems, it was boring and the opportunity came up in military. So all the morals went out the door. But there you go. It was only training stuff. But hopefully, if I leave you thinking, uh, if you keep in touch, if you ask questions or we have a bit of a discussion at the end, then this is all good stuff. Um, I'm going to take a very high level view. I imagine that some of the people who come to talk to the, the DEF CONs uh, talk uh, about very interesting vulnerabilities, how they were discovered, how you might actually patch and deal with them, how, how particular, well, what, what are generally labelled as hacks uh, were carried out and or interesting stories like this. I'm going to kind of take a much more of a, you know, cliche number 25B, a helicopter view. Uh, does come with a little bit of a health warning that I'm serious about everything that I do, but not necessarily about uh, the way that I do it. Um, but I do like joining dots and the more dots, the better. And I think it's important that we realize there are lots of dots because as I sort of was hinting at, at the beginning, the only thing that people seem to be able to handle with handle at any one time is one particular problem. Therefore, let's blame the users or let's uh, do up the users and uh, give them some training and that will make everything better again. I'm going to try and comply. I'm actually a standards person. I have quite a, a heavy audit background. I started in technical writing and did an awful lot in audit. I was quality manager and security manager and uh, have gone out, uh, you know, actually not just complying with standards, but developing standards. Uh, so I do like to comply with standards. So I hope that you will see that we are going to follow the rules of PowerPoint in this and you will find in this an iceberg analogy, a pyramid diagram, and the obligatory quote from Sun Tzu as well. So what kind of situation do we find ourselves in? What if you can spot a trend here? There I was on the BBC some years ago, I was called into Northwest tonight because it was a nice local story because it was a couple of a Salford couple who were putting Zeus Trojans on people's PCs to actually grab their um, grab their banking details. Uh, I was called back another time to talk about Ashley Madison. Uh, talk, talk. Oh, we haven't done the poll yet. Should we do the poll now where we find out who's got an Ashley Madison account? 
don't all rush at once, never mind. Uh, all kinds of speculation about uh, Russians uh, and what they may or may not be doing. Um, interesting different kinds of breaches not just the big data halls but the you know the the quiet sitting on people's systems and siphoning uh, off what was going on at the at the time and people putting in their credit card details and uh, slightly more recently uh, the fact that uh, all of this wonderful data which was being collected about coronavirus was actually being fed through an excel spreadsheet which was nicely truncating loads of the results haven't we all been there uh, let he without sin and cast the first stone and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but of course, being cybersecurity people, we're all now pure and we can all criticize everybody else. Um, it, and it's fun. And I certainly shouldn't wouldn't want to hear anything else said about Dido Harding because she's doing wonders for my media career. So uh, there's the CV. I always say that if you can't find out the details about me, then you probably shouldn't be in cybersecurity but uh, it's all there on LinkedIn. I thought I'd put up a picture of a towering intellect. Uh, oh, and uh, I know people like to see the, the statue of uh, Alan Turing as well. So uh, enjoy that. Uh, two, two poly degree, like I said, uh, you've just got to keep at things. I do believe in perseverance. Uh, that actually was from a genuine school report back in 1978. So, uh, Mr. Bissett and all you other teachers, uh, hey guys, look where I am now, but there you go. I am extremely proud and more than just a little bit surprised to get to work with some really cool people at the University of Manchester. We have a digital trust and security program. Our digital futures program stretches over about four, 1,400 different academics actually tackling real world problems. They're sort of across the top there. But the uh, the fun thing for the areas that kind of well, we as a, a collective and the you know colleagues on this uh, on this session uh, are are involved with is that uh, all of them need some sort of attention to cyber security or digital trust and security whatever label we put on it and that often means getting under the bonnet so our systems and software security group you know look at how we actually have can solve some of these real problems to make sure that when the, you know, the really cool applications are put together for healthcare, for example, that they are done in a, in a safe way. And this is very much part of the cyber ecosystem of Manchester. We're one of the four universities who is, the, is part of what we call the Greater Manchester Cyber Foundry, where we are trying to change the paradigm of fear, uncertainty and doubt to get people interested in cybersecurity and say how can small to medium-sized enterprises actually use cyber security uh, for uh, for growth and innovation uh, as well as the obvious things such as you know defending defending their business and that's great and we're working with manchester metropolitan university salford university and lancaster university as well uh, that's been going for well over two years now uh, and we are really making a difference to the way cyber security is uh, is treated which is great because let's face it nobody understands what we do nobody understands us but Okay, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a bit like when I was started off in technical writing that uh, it became very obvious quite quickly that the best writing is stuff that you don't notice, that you actually notice the content and you notice what is, and from our point of view, that what we are doing is actually working safely. So I'm going to talk about some of the research and activity that I'm doing. And the fun thing about this as well is it means I get to pass this straight on to students and I have students working on these aspects as well. Um, sometimes lots of students and uh, uh, perhaps uh, some of that hair loss from that first slide is because uh, of uh, the fact that uh, we actually had to take on at least 100 extra students uh because of all the exams issue that we had last year but that's not necessarily a bad thing uh, because of the independence that they've had to learn because of the change of teaching methods that we've had to employ through the uh, through 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 the lockdown so people are becoming more self-sufficient they're learning to ask questions they're better in being critical thinkers uh, and as a result the next generation i'm sure are going to pick up some of the ideas maybe some of the ideas i'm talking about this evening and really move things forward if it's easy you're not doing it right 
that's what my supervisor told me on my first day at work and i've sort of kind of remembered this ever since the ubiquity of all of this technology of the systems that we actually use those tv interviews the radio interviews normally end up with some silly point where the interviewer will say oh so to be safe we've got to switch off all of all of our computers and phones and let's face it you could do that but are you going to switch off your electricity and have no contact with the electric board are you going to not have a have a bank account uh, are you not going to use your car and your roads all of these other people are still going to be using systems with your data doing things which will affect the environment in which you live, live in so the most important thing to me in terms of security is engendering a community now i always used to refer to the community in terms of people and i'm actually starting to think that actually we ought to be including the technology as part of that uh, that uh, community as well where i got to at the end of my phd was essentially balancing the controls of how you control and keep security within a, a safe level within an acceptable level of risk and balance that sort of technological control with the attitude of people on the basis that uh, what some of the some of the most difficult people to get you for them to you get them to use some of the controls that you might put in may well be the very senior people setting policies so trying to get the chief exec to use a two-factor authentication just to explain it to them to, to stop and listen what it means is often very difficult but we came up with a way and producing a, a heat map which 10 years ago was very much a very popular part of producing something so that we could see where we were and then perhaps look to at least adjust the controls take on better controls to compensate for people's poor attitude to risk and that's something I want to return to uh, a little later. It's a whole hodgepodge of I mean, the number of different standards, the number of good practices that you can put into place uh, to make systems secure. There is plenty of information, there is plenty of research, there is plenty of experience and plenty of knowledge. The difficulty in proliferating it sometimes is the challenge that all of our systems do different things we might be running industrial control systems we might be calculating pensions it might be running the administration of a school or a university uh, it might be controlling the um sat nav in a car different purposes for different parts or perhaps wider systems and you know system where we draw the lines and systems can be very challenging which was a, a a challenge taken up by the gentleman in the little grey uh, oval there, Norbert Weiner, who was the first person to coin this term cybernetics about the idea that we take feedback and we act on it uh, within our systems. Many people on this call are probably thinking, well, cyber comes from cyberspace and William Gibson. Uh, that was 1984, I think. Well, if you flip that back, it was actually 1948 that that came about. And myself and Neera Jones, who at the time was the uh, head of risk at Barclay Card, realized that perhaps there are some universal objectives that every system should comply with, something that you can aim for, whether you're in industrial control, whether you're in finance, whether you're in food production or administration, whatever it might be. And these were these three ideas that a system must protect the protect people, not just data, but people say more about that in a moment. They it must react to bad things happening to preserve itself. But most importantly, everything that we do should be able to operate. I was asked some years back, not about three, about, must be about three years ago now, uh, sitting down to a nice big Friday night dinner with um, some friends and some people who they'd invited, I didn't know. And this guy says to me, um, well, Daniel, you're in cybersecurity. Are we winning? Well, it was Friday night. It was me night off. I really didn't want to talk about cybersecurity on that night. So I said to him, I said, look, the water's running, the traffic lights are changing, 
the lights are on, the food in front of us is hot, we're winning. Depends on the angle and the view that you actually take. Of course, perhaps it's a little bit like the duck, isn't it? That the duck is you know, serenely swimming across the water and what you don't see are the little legs going for it. So what's the problem? What's the problem we are facing? You see what I had to grow up with? Dixon and Doc Green. That was when everybody was nice to each other. Even, even the criminals didn't swear in those days. Now, one of the things that I have given up on is trying to keep this montage up to date. In fact, I did wonder how many times Carphone Warehouse has actually been hit. It seemed to be in the news all the time. And I was often over going across to the BBC to Salford to, or on the radio to discuss the, the latest hack of the Carphone Warehouse. So what do you do in this situation? You put into the search engine of your choice Carphone Warehouse uh, uh, data hacks. And what does it come back with? I'm not sure whether that was actually what they intended that advert to mean. But, okay, you know, words are cheap out there on the internet. The other thing that upsets me is that as soon as you start talking about cybersecurity, people start falling asleep. Oh, oh. But the thing that actually wakes them up is when you start yeah. talking about data protection, because they start thinking data protection, information commissioner, fines good, good, good. and stuff like that. But it's Data protection is a very, very, very narrow view. I mean, we're talking about, you know, political voting systems. We're talking about the operation of the National Health Service, you know, people's appointments, data on their health. We're talking about things like the, the, you know, the um, infiltration well, of the uh, Office of Personnel Management, being able to put together a picture of how the United States operates from an intelligence point of view. We're talking about industrial control systems, intellectual property, uh, espionage. Love showing this to my Chinese students. And I'm sure it's just coincidence that those two planes happen to, happen to look extremely alike. When it comes down to it, yes, money is important, but there are so many other aspects to having to secure cyber systems to make things safe. Car phone warehouse again, PI, personally identifiable information. And the actual wherewithal and the tools that we're actually using. And I think as a narrative, it's really important to stop calling it data protection because what we are actually protecting are people. Now there is actually an online harms bill coming out, but it's very narrow from our point of view. And I think we really need to understand the harms that so-called cybersecurity breaches can actually bring about and actually cause. Because if we understand the harms, that gives us the bigger picture, that wider picture about what we can do to prevent them and to help people cope. One thing that bothers me quite a lot is that we talk about digital inclusion and occasionally we're able to do good things like give laptops to families who hadn't had them as a route so they can, you know, the kids can learn uh, during, the, during the lockdowns and the like. But we do very little to prevent a, an exclusion after that caused by bad things happening to them. And given the fact that they start investing their time and their effort in using uh, what, what we give them and the position that they were in before that, they will probably have very few resources to be able to pull themselves out of it. So we really need to think who it is that we need to blame. Perhaps we don't need to blame anyone. Perhaps it's more complex than laying blame. Just think about the, the wanna cry activities. Uh, you might have come across the idea uh, that the one thing that will make people look in the other direction is if you can blame it on somebody else and make it somebody else's problem, the SEP field that Douglas Adams um, talks about. This may not be my only Douglas Adams quote, but with WannaCry, what happened? But, you know, firstly, everybody started getting crossed with China because they read the ransom note. And if you've had perhaps uh, instructions uh, on a product translated from the Chinese into English, you'd probably look at that and think, oh, yes, that's definitely been written by somebody in China. And then other people said, no, it's the users. You know, we've just got to stop them clicking on the wrong stuff. That will be the solution to the problem. 
Other people said it was the government funding. If only they gave us enough money, we could go around patching all the equipment. And other people said, well, it's the IT department. You know, how, how much, how difficult can it be to patch a few machines? Uh, well, yeah, but be fair to them because it's the NHS, isn't it? The NHS has just got so complex over the years. It's like the house that Jack built in terms of information systems. And then somebody else spotted this and said, actually, that's not Ch the Chinese. That's how and somebody from North Korea would write English if you they wanted you to think it was a Chinese person writing it. I hope you're keeping up with this. Uh, it then started getting around to, well, actually, maybe the National Security Agency were a bit naughty for not disclosing this vulnerability and worse than that, putting the tools together to exploit it. And then some people even said, well, perhaps Microsoft and Apple and uh, when it comes to vulnerabilities, you know, why did they give us broke product in the first place? Uh, uh, and eventually, eventually people said, well, you know, maybe we should get a little bit cross with the bad guys and the people actually committing the crimes in the first place. So with all that going on, we expect people to get on and do their jobs on systems which essentially rely on some sort of interlinking, might be hyperlinks, might be something else. And we tell them to get on and do their jobs uh, under pressure, but don't click on everything. And we ask them to make decisions. So whose fault is it? Particularly in cybersecurity, there's an awful lot of kind of looking down and sort of sort of holier than thou. So I just want you to take a moment and think, actually, what has really, what really upsets us? What really upsets us? Very interestingly, it was, I think it was on not, not um, have I got news for you uh, this week? It was pointed out the huge fuss which was made about the, about the Super League. Everybody got really, really upset about the Super League. Now, if everybody got as upset about the Super League as they did about racism in football, maybe we would have been able to make a difference by now so yeah it's people's perspective but perhaps the perspective when it comes to technology is because you okay me as well uh, we get upset perhaps about the wrong things you know the low signal the the rubbish bandwidth and the, the low battery i mean let's face it you know we want our systems be, to be cheap and fast and resilient you can have two. Oh, yeah, and you can all have a chorus of two out of two out of three ain't bad. But it means that we've got to make decisions and we've got to understand. And we have to understand as a collective and understand that the decisions that we make as we develop and test and deliver systems are just as important as that person under pressure to get some work done is going to click on that link, which is going to be a, uh, cause some sort of download and exploit based on a vulnerability, perhaps of even a zero day, even if it was something that could have been patched previously. Because the way we structure things is completely upside down. If you look at the organogram of an organization, they're generally sort of pyramid shaped, aren't they? You've got the chief exec somewhere at the top. The reality of cybersecurity is that you've got somebody on a minimum wage of nine pounds something an hour, and you're giving them the responsibilities for multi billion pound assets. So we really need to rethink how we balance that and how much support we give them. Unfortunately, unfortunately, with this kind of blame game idea and saying, well, we shouldn't blame them because perhaps they haven't been educated, so we should give them user awareness training, that we think were angels if we turn this whole thing around and give them that support and give them more tools in terms of their awareness and their understanding of the problem. But that's only part of us, and this kind of makes me a little bit cross. Hence the GIF. Because cybersecurity and our systems aren't complicated. They are complex. So we've really got to learn to be able to juggle more than one problem at once. We can't just say, uh, you know, uh, use a weakness or use a strength. Uh, we can't talk about technology or we can't talk about people. We have to look at them and how they interact together.
because that's what's actually going on as we speak. Now, I don't know whether this means anything to anybody, but this is very important from a view of community and what can happen when things actually go awry. This is the uh, classification of cybersecurity incidents according to the National Cybersecurity Center. What it boils down to, what it boils down to is kind of right at the top in the first in the first instance, then or, uh, the, the big incidents, then law enforcement and National Cybersecurity Center, part of GCHQ, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is going to come and be able to lend a hand and support right at the bottom of the scale, right at the bottom of the scale, you've got a huge part of the community which actually says they're going to get some online advice on how to cope with an incident, which is fine if they're going to read it beforehand. But if they've actually been knocked offline, then giving them some online advice probably isn't going to help. So we've got a huge spectrum with all the various parts in between. And as cities are now exercising what happens in a citywide cybersecurity incident, we now have to balance and look at see, see how that's actually going to apply across the community and how that helps and who can actually work together. Because, yeah, kind of who are the little people going to call? Everybody will think that they are important until something really bad happens. A few years ago in Manchester, they did a survey of who in the local authority areas thought they were first responders and mobile library people put themselves in the first responder category along with the police and the ambulance and the fire and rescue people as well and actually they weren't that, that far off because apparently mobile libraries uh, in, a, in a really bad incident might actually be used as mobile mortuaries so everybody has a part to play of course when bad stuff happens we all you know, contemplate our navels and we look at some for somebody to actually blame. A lot of the time we might be left alone, particularly those people who have been digitally included and are now knocked off and they're excluded. So we have to care. We have to think of the spectrum of harms and how we as a community, we in the wider sense, can work together to avoid these in the first place, but most importantly as well, cope with the fact that these things are actually going to happen. So in terms of ecology, I mean, I don't know how many other people have been told this over the years, but every time in my career, when I've gone to a boss with an idea, I've been patted on the head, probably that explains where the hair has gone, and told, no, 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 uh, we want evolution, not revolution. But when things have changed, we do describe them as revolutions. We talk about the agricultural revolution, when the, you know, the um, disparate use of the land was brought within enclosures for better organisation to grow, to feed the growing population. As populations then moved into towns and we, we uh, the, the real perhaps age of consumerism perhaps started, um, then we had the in, first of the industrial revolutions. Then we learned to do things in bigger quantities and with more power. Uh, you know, this is even before we got to the stage of needing 15 different adapters to charge our devices. And now we're in that stage of our third industrial revolution, where it's electronics and IT and so-called automation. How many of us actually grew up with the promise? How many of our parents grew up with the promise? How many of our grandparents grew up with the promise that we were going to have so much leisure time and we're not going to have to do very much, if any, work at all because we're going to have machines to do it? Yeah, it happened. That, that was the story that we were all told. And here am I working on a Sunday night. No, just joking, I enjoyed this. And now we're into the fourth industrial revolution, 
where you know we're moving you know we're making things smaller and making things wider we're connecting more things together and perhaps that connection is happening faster than we can actually cope with it but the perhaps the biggest connection that we are missing has to be the fifth industrial revolution and i'm not talking about you know, steve austin six million dollar man but it probably be of a particular age to be able to appreciate that. I'm not talking about turning us all into cyborgs, but to a certain extent, we already are. If you ever get a chance to hear uh, Professor Colin Williams, um, he's currently studying, uh, I think he's at Oxford at the moment or Cambridge, I really should get the two of those sorted out uh, and get through a lot of trouble if you, uh, if you, if you confuse, the, if confuse the two of them. But he recognises kind of the history of this idea of a kind of homo cyborgia and the idea that we're, that we're heading towards some sort of uh, uh, you know, mass turning into part machines. Um, at some point, he, uh, he often stops his lecture and asks anybody in the room who has a filling to put their hand up. And of course, most people do. And he points out that they're no longer completely human. But uh, it goes beyond that. And he discusses how much tech do you rely on before you lose that humanity? And perhaps the other way around, how much tech needs to, uh, runs before tech becomes its own definition of, uh, of humanity. Often talk about, he points out, we talk about persons in law, but there is no legal definition of who, of who is, a, of what a human is. So the route map I'm trying to travel on at the moment, is looking how we can at least make those first connections or improved connections so they're working better with the technology. You might have come across a piece of work called Marcus Raynan, The Six Dumbest Ideas in Computer Security. Worthwhile looking it up. Uh, his fifth idea, which is the only one I disagree with, actually says, forget people, you've got to have technology compensating for everything. And we know that we are not at that stage yet. We may never be. There may be something that will be invented, which will be just so wow. And I suppose if I knew what it was, I wouldn't be talking to Worcester on a Sunday night. I'd be out there making my fortune. Actually, I wouldn't be. I'd be using it for all the leisure time that I was promised. We've been robbed, haven't we? The one common thing that we need to remember is the context of the systems that we use. That all systems will have their own objectives, but it's difficult for people working in industrial control, in um, school systems, in governmental systems, in military systems, to have those government, to have those common viewpoints. And as a result of which we see silly marketing banter about you know military grade there was a somebody posted on uh, twitter here's here's some here's some lovely military grade equipment uh you know mi, you know kind of military grade accommodation and it was a tatty tent uh you know military gr grade toilet facilities and it was a field latrine yeah you know, all of that stuff yeah you know, it's it's how it's how we it's how we view things but there are certain commonalities certain rules that we can follow but the problem is is keeping them together and making them seem as a whole, which is why some of the standards and the benchmarks for security, which are actually published, uh, end up as sort of shopping lists and we tick the boxes, but we don't really view uh, them in context and how they actually come together. I often say that if you put all the, ex the cybersecurity experts in a room with a blank sheet of paper, we'll still come out with something looking like ISO 27001. So we need something dynamic and we need something from a standards point of view. Remember the, the Roman soldiers and their standards, they, they keep a view of keeping that yeah, SPQR, their standard. That was the thing that they needed to protect. When that was gone, they didn't have anything that they that brought them together. So we need this idea that what we are trying to do is to help people cope and to avoid harms. Uh, but it's a big field there is lots to do we set our objectives we want some degree of, re uh, of resilience and we want to at least reduce things to residual risk and if one thing might come out of the horrors of the pandemic perhaps it might be a better understanding that not just 
risks are additive in terms of exposure to bad stuff, but also the things that you can do are additive as well. And some things are individual and some things are community. Hopefully we'll reach the right destination. And with a bit of luck, it won't take us five years to do so. So with all of these components, perhaps what we need to look to is adaptation. Cyber means steering. It means it talks about governance, going all the way back to our first industrial revolution, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the first in, well, the industrial revolution uh, in terms of uh, mechanics and, and steam engines. But it's not just the mechanics, it's the people governors as well. It's the Gene Hunt and the California governor, governor there, for those who are still trying to work out how my sense of humor works. The psychiatrists are still working on it. So Nira and I observed that one of the beauties, maybe flawed, but one of the beauties of the fiction of uh, Isaac Asimov and a guy called Campbell as well, I think who codified them in the first place, is that amongst all that fantastic future technology, they focused on a few key points, a few key basics. Because the problem with us in cybersecurity, uh, it doesn't take long before somebody shouts out cryptography and you're going down a rabbit hole of different forms and different mechanics of ways of doing it. Uh, and we lose the very people who we want to embrace to understand what they need from our systems. So we can reduce these three laws of, or transform these basic three laws into ways of looking how we transform our lack of symbiosis between people and technology and recognize that, yes, our systems have to pr do pr protect uh, um, the assets, which are actually the often just the representation of the people, you know, my, my, my records with the gas board or uh, the tax office and the like there, you know, those are th those are meta -mes. The systems have to process, they have to work out what my pension's going to be eventually, not, <laughs> not too far away, perhaps, who knows. Um, uh, but as well as the complexity, the fact that there are going to be bad people trying to do bad stuff, and sometimes the technology itself will do bad stuff because we haven't thought it through and it will start to fail, then we need the interaction of the technology and the people to end up in a safe place, this idea of self-preservation so it can react. The, again, our fault here is that we talk about the glamour of artificial intelligence helping us in that particular area. Realizing that these are tools to use, but they're tools to be used sensibly and in the right place and in the right way, rather than throwing them out there in the same way that we have now with so many of the Internet of Things. I was talking to somebody who dealt in an Internet of Things devices, selling them, and he was very, very proudly telling me that as far as he was concerned, his opportunity was to sell uh, connected devices. Uh, there were no laws, that's going to change, there were no laws governing the quality uh, from a security point of view of these devices. Therefore, he could happily leave it to the next generation to solve that problem. As an entrepreneur, the opportunity was there, and we see this happening all the time. I was just reading in Gordon Carrera's book about you know, the, the, you know, the, the history that I think a lot of people have forgotten. Yes, there are still flaws in Microsoft, but remember how it used to be in the old days. And I think originally uh, Bill Gates used to say that security was the problem of Microsoft's partners. And then he turned it around and basically made the goal of Microsoft trustworthy computing. We might say it's got a way to go. But that's because we want it fast and cheap and resilient. And of course, we don't want to pay for it. So we need to bring things back and think about, you know, what risks can we handle? What risks can, do we have to leave? And what can we adjust to make things safe? Because this is where we get to universal objectives. Now, here's a little bit of real history about 
how we got to where we are now in terms of our interpretation with risk. Anyone recognise that? I can't see many heads. But I don't know whether anybody recognises that figure. That's uh, that slarty bard fast from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the TV adaptation. Um, this is the bit that you might want to cut out for public consumption, but uh, just an interesting bit of trivia. Um, Douglas Adams thought that the Slarty Bardfast should have a terrible secret, and his uh, was it, it was his name, Slarty Bardfast, because he didn't in the beginning he didn't want to actually tell anybody what he was called, and so he thought what was the most outrageous name that he could come up with. So eventually he got to Slarty Bardfast, but he did start with Farty Fuckballs to begin with, and work backwards from there. But that wasn't the history I really wanted to tell you about. It was where did this idea of risk emerged, emerged, emerge from? It was all about sailing the seven seas into uncharted waters, into maps which would say, here be dragons, because of course, the people who drew the maps didn't know what was there. Uh, they didn't want people to find out that their maps were rubbish. So they thought if they put here be dragons, it would stop people sailing a little bit too far. So it was sailing out into unknown space from, from a watery point of view. And eventually people started to transfer that onto time. So it wasn't just a matter of something happening. It was a matter of when it would happen as well. And as a result of those thoughts, we could start thinking about the probability of what might happen and whether we were bothered about it. Start because nearly went into the Catherine Tate territory there. And when a risk you know, is going, I mean, if we know it's definitely going to happen, my ship is going to definitely, if I overload it, it is definitely going to sink. Uh, and shark infested waters, that's bad news. If I know it's certainly gonna happen, that's not a risk anymore. We know that's there. So we can start to actually do things about it, to get things down to an acceptable level. We can contain the risks. The model I always love is, you know, that of the kind of, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the donut shaped particle accelerators with the little particles whizzing around inside them and all of these magnetic fields adjusting themselves to keep those particles within that shape and that's almost like our systems should be operating like that ma making those constant adjustments for us to keep our data in the right place and at the right quality as well and taking the right actions because going back to those different things it's not just about the data it's what actual data will do so it's not just kind of you know data and records it's actually data which is going to go and open a valve in a in a power station or, or a water treatment plant in florida for example but if we never lose sight of the objectives, then we can start to do things to adjust the levels of risk and remove this click, don't click burden from these poor people who get stuck on the end of the system and beca suddenly become the front line. So how might we do it? This is where I'm going to start leaving you with some jigsaw pieces. Firstly, there in front of you, is the Lockheed Martin kill chain refresher. Now, the kill chain is very interesting because I think it's a great overlay on often what goes on. But as has often been said, with so many things, it, it not, sometimes isn't always in the right order, but all the parts are actually there. But if we know the parts, then we can do things to actually make sure that the people who want their, our systems to work for them rather than for us have a little bit of difficulty. We can reduce the value. I remember years ago when we were looking at the first National Cyber Security Center, sorry, the first National Cyber Security Strategy, the question was, and I think this was pushed under the table and left and nobody ever did anything with it, that the only way of really making our system secure is to devalue them and from the point of view of the people who would want to attack them and take over them. Um, Bruce Schneier talks about this kind of thing in his attack trees where he talks about making the uh, attack much more expensive than the, uh, the attacker can actually profit from. So if we can get this right, if we can get the protection and the self-preservation around the operation, then perhaps we can cope. 
And that remains the objective for every system, whether it's treating water, uh, putting the fuel rods into a nuclear power station, uh, or making sure that you can pay the bills tonight because it's the end of the month and the electric's due. But it's going to need some change. It's going to need being able to be fleet of foot and being able to move and react and detect and put in place new stuff and also build firmly on the old stuff. It's almost like, I don't know whether anybody's uh, uh, driven a Mercedes. I don't have a Mercedes, but I once got one from the car the, the carpool. And the, the, the Mercedes have a, have a foot brake, which is a handbrake as well. So you've got four pedals. And I never got my life's ambition to be in musical theatre. There we go. There's a confession. Uh, but the nearest I ever came to tap dancing was being having to move between these different pedals at the right at the right time to keep the car from rolling away, rolling away down the hill. But those are fairly simple, just complicated activities. What we need is to be able to work with the computational kit to be able to have these uh, so we can react in complex situation, get the balance between the people and technology that I was talking about earlier. And we can reduce this, and this is what I did back in the PhD days, uh, to produce a kind of a model of people's attitude, to know what support we need to build in, in terms of how our systems look after themselves, but also care with how people work together as well. Now, it's funny, or a lovely coincidence, that the psychologists have actually been looking at a five-part uh, uh, five list of character, uh, people's characteristics, which perhaps, and again, this is one of the big jigsaw pieces that I'm putting in here, that we can start to look to tune that attitude to risk. These five areas, not going to read them all out. These uh, are available. There's a, a excuse me, there's a reference there that you that you can follow up. Look at how different people will how people will react in different situations, and we can look at them and get a balance and perhaps contemplate how our systems and the technology should react and work with people who will react to different situations at different times. We're entering now a level of complexity with these components. So from the people aspect, we've got the idea of people's attitude, we've got their characteristics, and then to put those together and mix those with the machines. I was walking, one of the things I now miss because of the, you know, the, the situation and the university not doing any face-to-face -face teaching is my walk to the office. You can always tell where somebody is in the organization by how far away they park their car from their office. So I've got a one mile walk from the car park to my office every day or had, and that's when I do some thinking. And it's during that time when I was thinking of the analogies about risk and its origins in sailing, that actually most of the things that I was thinking about began with C. Now, the other thing that psychologists talk about is brain-wise, we can generally handle five, seven plus or minus two items at once, which is you know, when you're grouping things to work on, then you should work within this Miller limit. So seven is quite a good number of components to, to, to play with. Think of the circus act spinning the plates, perhaps to be really sensible in terms of keeping an eye on what's going on, you, uh, then the amateur circus person probably will not want to have what more than seven plates. But I thought about, well, what about seven Cs? Perhaps systems should complement what I'm doing automate when it's helpful, take over from me when it's not. We have our systems in place because we can't be everywhere and do everything and often do it fast enough. That's why we want this technology. But at the same time, we might want to have decisions on what we do. We might want our own level of governance. Governance itself, 
um, friend of friend Roy used to be the uh, head of architecture at Barclays. He used to he used to say, or probably still does for that matter, um, that governance is a balance of two things: it's decision rights and escalation paths. When are those when are those decisions made by the machine? And when are they escalated um, to, to, to the people? And where do the people escalate things to machines to help them make further decisions? So this isn't always a kind of you know a, a single path. It's moving up and between the two. I want machines to compensate for bad things that I might do. I want to have confidence that the knowledge of vulnerabilities in the system will be compensated. It might be a patch or whatever, but the, or the ways or the ways of working. I want it to cooperate with me. I want it to do stuff which will help me. And I want it to be an eight to enable my job or whatever task I wanted to do. I don't want to have to hack around and come up with my own separate little spreadsheet to handle some results because the main system won't, won't do it or it becomes too difficult or find, finding the workarounds. If I'm doing it wrong, that collective wisdom, other people will have probably made mistakes as well. So I want the lessons to be learned to make, and, and to enable some sort of sort of suggestion box so in the same way that the system will correct we can feed back into the system and the people who create it to make those corrections rather than these systems that go out one of the issues that was there on that kind of wanna cry example of who do we blame etc cetera, etc cetera. you might have noticed down down at the bottom right that perhaps many people had not considered some of these systems would last so long so they were being used and you know the people who created some of the stuff which was now affected by that they would long since lost their support uh, as a result i remember i used to work for an organization um where one of the problems would ar would arise if a system went wrong is that the systems have been in place for so long there were actually very few of the programmers either still working and in some cases still alive who could actually make those changes and, co and, and correct things we're part of a community. I do not know why in the 21st century, information is still being passed from one system to another and being rekeyed. Why do we not have that interoperability? Why are we not living together? Why are we still having such rival um, systems? And cybersecurity is perhaps one of the worst. When we get back to Olympia or wherever we go to for um, the kind of the big infosec uh, ex exhibitions, uh, everybody is claiming that their system is what is going to make us safe. If I had a spray can and a ladder, I'd be going around and adding the, the letter R to the end to the end of every stall that made that claim. Because the most important thing that I want is for the technology and me and colleagues working together to deliver the objectives there will be problems along the way you know, it's, you know the old uh, adage of it's not uh, will you be attacked it's when and the attack may come from within uh, from a floor which somebody had not realized was there until a particular set of options uh, actually came about the so-called perfect storm i want to be able to cope with what goes on so those are my components. How will I know that I've, I've reached them? Well, sticking with the sea and the oceans, I don't know how many people have ever heard of the Plimsoll line. The, you know, yeah, it's of, of the people I can see on screen, I can see two people, one put their hand up, that's 50%, that's pretty good going. The, the, I, the, plimps, the people realized back in the 19th century that if you loaded a ship in one place, when to warmer climes, for example, what was good in cold water was not uh, good in warm water and warmer water, perhaps I should say, and the ship, the ships would capsize and sink. Um, you know, th th this was long before they had ships big enough to, of course, jam, jam themselves in the Suez Canal. This was, a, this was another problem. So they came up with the Plimsoll line, an idea of making sure that the system the ship stays above the water. So I wondered if there is a dashboard which will inform us from a point of view of dials of the levers that we can then pull to adjust things to make our systems safe 
help us cope with the problems and the challenges and the things that we actually want to be able to do. So looking at the people and the technology mix and the way that they work, we can look at those seven C's. I'm not saying that training and education and user awareness is not a, is, is a bad thing. I think it's just that we rely on it too much. Uh, you know, these problems because people, people weren't made aware. Well, perhaps they were made aware, but it's 10 to five. They want to go home, pick up the kids from school, make dinner, go to the pub, as we all hopefully will, et cetera, et cetera. But, put it in context with the rest of things that people should not be compensating for poor design in the first place and as we've rushed to, to join our information technology with our operational technology and do great things with it of course the more we join it the more routes we find for mistakes to happen and for bad people to find their ways to do bad stuff as well so as we rush to join things up with our billions and billions and depending on which report you read it's 20 billion or it's 40 billion internet of things devices perhaps we need to think more about segmentation than we knew need to do <clears throat> about joining things up and rather than just monitoring we need to know what we're going to do when we discover stuff and to discover stuff early enough because it's still months that people can be on our systems before we find out, find that they're there. Even just this week, you know, from a small, innocent user, for we'll coin a phrase point of view, the National Cybersecurity Center was having to advise people who downloaded a, 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 a so-called tracking app scam uh, onto their phones that they're gonna have to completely reset their phones. Now, I'm quite sure all of the wonderful Worcester DEF CON people are, have all got their phones backed up. No worry. Factory reset and reload. I can, I was just wondering why everybody suddenly disappeared off the screen. No, only joking. Um, so, yeah, we might know that actually data doesn't exist until it's in three places. But who, who out, apart from the perhaps the technology professionals for want of a term not sure whether i actually like the word professional um will actually be bothered or think about that phone as part of a bigger system as part of the linchpin in their life it's just something that's there and you get on with it and you get used to it so what we need to do is coping and the recovery capability all the way through to the big situations think Maersk and uh, what happened to them with not Petya and 300 million pounds or dollars to rebuild their systems which wouldn't have been possible if they hadn't found a, an image uh, of uh, of their basic system in Ghana because Ghana part of their office in Ghana had, had, had a fortunately it had a power cut but actually the full coping from a community point of view when those systems go offline or they don't deliver the services in that way we need those ways of continuing to live so that our systems will protect operate and self-preserve so as far as this anthropotechnicum this community this world view this symbiosis of people and technology yeah okay we might not necessarily be in a good place at the moment but in terms of getting good to good places you need a good positive view the historian uh toynbee points out that and any civilization that doesn't have a positive view of where it is going will stagnate and decay and perish which is a thought so if we have a positive view of how our systems can work together and work better with people perhaps we've got a route out of this and perhaps tonight we should feel just that little bit guilty because we have these great expectations of ai on one hand and we've got people telling us that actually it's very dangerous on the other perhaps if we'd been a little bit more understanding and nicer to that little clippy about what we wanted from our systems and how Clippy could actually help us. We might be working better and have that symbiosis today. I don't know, that's a thought to leave you with, but thank you for listening.